This isn't so much one encounter, but it was a terrifying experience. I've never told this story to anyone besides the police, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately and only recently realized how much this whole thing really fucked me up. So here goes. I met this guy at a bar one night. We had a great time, partied all night, and eventually ended up back at my apartment. After that night, he basically lived with me instead of the hostel he was staying at. We clicked right away, and I enjoyed having him there. We dated for almost three months before the first night he attacked me. It was the night that we celebrated my 30th birthday party. I had a blast and passed out around 3 a.m. He had told me that he suffered from PTSD and night terrors. He had woken up many nights freaking out. I was deeply passed out when I was woken up by five quick blows to my head and face. I tried to cover myself not knowing what the hell was going on when I realized my arms were pinned to my side. He was sitting on my chest with his legs on my arms and strangled me before I had any idea where I was. I only remember the light fading and going black as he squeezed harder on my neck. When he let go, the blood eventually rushed back to my brain and I remember seeing him walk to the bathroom. At that point, I grabbed my dogs and ran to my car and took off. He must have passed back out. He called me hours later completely confused of where I went. I told him everything he had done and he promised me he didn't mean to do any of that and that he would never do that on purpose and promised to seek help. I agreed to come back on the terms that if he ever scared me again, he'd be gone. Exactly one week later, again in my sleep, I woke up with him on top of me. I slowly pushed him off and pretended to get ready for work. Out of nowhere, he jumped up and sucker punched me in the mouth. I fell onto the bed and he again tried to strangle me. This time I didn't fight it and pretended to pass out. He let me go once he thought I passed out and went into the kitchen. As soon as he left, I grabbed my dogs and booked it to my car again. I jumped into my car and locked it. This time he chased me. This is when I realized this wasn't some PTSD nightmare sleepwalking freakout. He was a psychopath. He was awake and very coherent. He started screaming that he would burn my house down if I didn't come out, trying to break my windows and get into my car. As soon as I got my doors locked, I called the cops. He went back inside. When the cops arrived, I told him that he was crazy and might try to attack them. When they went in, he was quietly awaiting for them and went with them without any resistance. He knew what he did. It wasn't until the trial that I found out that he had a knife under the bed. When he let me go and went to the kitchen thinking I passed out, he went to get a butcher's knife and left it on the bed to chase me out. No one could prove what he was planning but I'm convinced that he was going to stab me to death. He wasn't charged with anything at the end because the DA pulled some fancy luring maneuvers and tricked him into walking right out into the arms of the ice as soon as he left the courtroom. I have to say that that was satisfying to watch. He was deported and banned from the country. He continues to try to contact me on social media by making new accounts to try to get me to help his appeal and be allowed back. Nope. He still claims that he wasn't awake for any of this. I don't know what to believe, but I know that I feel a fuck lot safer with him on the other side of the globe. I've been having a hard time sleeping since then. I kind of brushed everything off and carried on with my life, as if nothing ever happened. Thinking about it recently, I realized that being attacked in your sleep and coming that close to possibly being a murder victim might cause some long-lasting psychological damage. I am considering seeking help. I think maybe sharing this story for the first time might be a healthy first step. So this story I'm about to tell you just happened recently, but to connect all the pieces correctly, I have to tell you a little backstory as well. So I'm a 26 year old gay man and a few months ago I got a message and a friend request from an ex. This ex was my first when I was 16, and he was 5 years older. Long story short, he dumped me right before Christmas. He claimed he couldn't handle the age gap and completely shut me off. I was devastated and was depressed for 6 months after this happened. I was only 16 at the time, so I haven't heard from him in ages. 
and the random times I would stalk him on social media, I never found anything. A couple years ago, I did find a Facebook page and saw a few posts of his family members, and it almost looked like he had died. I assumed suicide or something similar, and I actually kind of forgot about the whole thing. Then I received a friend request and a message. Me being the nice person, I decided since I was completely over him, I would engage in conversation and see what happens. Everything was normal for a situation like this, and he explained that he went to jail for a few years. After chatting for a while, while catching up, we stopped talking for a while. Nothing unusual either. Then a few weeks ago, he started messaging me again. This time, something seemed weird. He was talking about relationships and getting very upset over details about my current relationship. I thought this was extremely odd and kind of stopped chatting back. Suddenly, there were posts on social media and mass texts that he needed help. He was getting kicked out of his apartment. But the odd thing was, he was just moving to another apartment. After a few more random text messages ranging from, I need help, I can't handle life, come hang out on the rooftop, and just condescending updates online, he finally asked why I hadn't responded to any of his help requests, and how he thought I was better than that. At this point, I was really annoyed and decided that I would just end this. I told him that I didn't think our friendship would work, and I was glad to catch up and wished him the best. No response. I figured he got the message and was just not going to respond. A few days passed and still no response. I deleted his messages and moved on. Two days later, a flower on my porch. I didn't think anything of it and continued on with my everyday life. Then I noticed some other odd things. Around my house, some of the plants were pressed down like someone had stomped them. It was only around my bedroom window and my bathroom. My backyard looks out over a farm and woods, so I never have my curtains closed. Thinking this was odd, I still never connected the two things. I figured that animals must lay down there or something. A couple days later when I came home later in the evening, I noticed the power was off to the house. I noticed a storm headed to us, but it hasn't hit yet. Plus, we don't normally lose power. I pulled my keys out and opened the front door leaving my car in the driveway instead of the garage. I live in a really safe area, so I didn't even bother locking my car. Inside my house, the curtains were still pulled shut, and it was semi-dark. With no power on, the air was starting to get stuffy. I put my stuff down in the kitchen and headed to the basement to check the power box. Walking down the steps, I heard a noise on the other side of the house, but I didn't stop, as I have cats, and they tend to jump and run around. Everything was on and nothing looked odd about the electrical box. I walked back upstairs and at this point, I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. I froze, my mind raced, and my only thought was to act natural, as if I didn't see anything. I faked a little sneeze to make up for the sudden freezing. I quickly pulled out my phone and texted my friend, 911, help, and quickly called her. She didn't pick up, damn it. I casually left a voicemail. Uh, hey, I just got home. I have no power. You and Dave said you're still coming over like you said? Just come in. The back door will be open. I tried to sound casual, but off for her. Dave is actually her father's name, and we've never called him by his name unless she was telling stories about his time in the war. She was also not supposed to be coming over that night either. I casually walked to the back door, trying to watch my entire surroundings. I didn't see anything or hear anything. I just started to think that my mom was playing tricks on me. I go to unlock the back door and the screen door is always locked. Both were unlocked. Try not to panic, I just opened the door and let the screen door open. I slowly turned and tried to think of something else I can do that might casually get me out of the house quickly. As I was standing in my kitchen thinking about making a run for my car, I heard a loud bang outside. I jumped and ran to the front door. Nothing. I looked over and saw my car's interior lights on, though. Did someone just break into my car? I turned to grab my keys from the kitchen when I saw something move in the living room. I don't know why I said, Hello? As soon as I did, I wanted to kick myself. 
I slowly moved to the kitchen to grab my car keys and run, but they were gone. How were they gone? That's all I remember before I was waking up in my bed, all the lights on in my bedroom. It felt like a truck had hit me. My entire body was sore and heavy. My eyes slowly focused on the room and I managed to pull myself into the sitting position. What the hell happened, I thought. I slowly stood up and searched for my phone. It was on the kitchen island. The time was 2.30 a.m. I quickly searched through my text messages. Nothing that was odd. Feeling a little less groggy, I checked my doors, windows, and all the rooms. I don't fully know what happened that night, but there was no evidence of someone being in my home. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night and honestly felt a little bit crazy. The following morning, however, was a different story. I had finally fallen asleep sometime after 4, and I woke up around 8 a.m. to a text message on my phone. It was a random number and it only said, Last night was fun. We should do it again. With initials after it. I just froze. Those were the same as my ex. I immediately texted back, What did you do? But I got a message back saying the number was invalid. I never heard anything again or had any weird occurrences again. Hopefully I never do. So the story happened to me the first year of high school. I met a guy called Nathan and we became close very quickly because we were both introverted and shy. So we understood each other and were comfy around each other. I was very emeritive because he was the sweetest and the most respectful boy I've ever met. He always made sure I was okay and not scared with him because I'm a very shy person. We were very close and he was very handsome so everyone thought that we were together and a lot of girls were into him and I thought I was into him too which was not wrong. We were just friends but we started flirting a little bit but we were both young and shy 14 years old so nothing happened. The next year of high school he moved to another city and we stopped talking not because we stopped liking each other but just because life made it this way. After one year, we started talking again, and we were both very happy and had a lot of fun talking on Snapchat, and even started flirting a little bit. He decided to go back to the city where our school was, and asked me to hang out with him, alone. I was totally okay about him, because as I said, he was very respectful, and I trusted him deeply. We saw each other two times alone, and everything went well. We had a lot of fun, and I felt very safe. He asked me to come to his house for a party with me and his friends that I know too, because some of his old friends are mine too. I said okay and went to his city, which was far away from my home. Obviously, there was some alcohol, and Nathan and I were laughing about it because I get drunk quickly, but I was totally fine with being drunk around him because I knew that he would protect me from any danger. So I started drinking around 10 p.m., but not a lot because I was supposed to come home the following day in my friend's car and I didn't want to vomit in the car. Since I did this, I don't have any memories of the party except the fact that I danced with Nathan and all the stuff which happened in the very beginning of the party before drinking. In the morning, I woke up in a room, but I don't remember if it was the place I fell asleep in. I felt very sick, like I'd never been before. And it was very hard for me to move. I was almost paralyzed. I succeeded on standing up and looked out the window just next to me because I heard some noises. I saw the person who was supposed to drive me home leave the house. Trying to scream to catch her attention even though the windows were closed, I was too weak to scream or focus on anything. I fell asleep again because I was very sick and woke up a bit after, but I was still tired and I searched for the phone around me without finding it. It seemed weird because I always kept the phone right next to me. I was still tired and a bit sick, so I laid there and closed my eyes. A few minutes after, I heard Nathan entering the room and touching me, checking if I was okay. I don't know why, but I kept my eyes closed and didn't move. Also, I had my back to him, so he didn't see my face, and I guess he thought I was still asleep. When he left the room, he locked me in, and I started panicking. Why would he lock me in? 
I didn't focus on that because I trusted him, but I had a weird feeling. I rested for a little and woke up and knocked on the door of the room. Nathan opened it up and I asked him why he locked me in the room and why my friends left without me. He said he locked the room because he didn't want anyone to bother me and that I was very drunk and he was worried. So he preferred letting me sleep in even though my friend was leaving and his aunt was coming in the afternoon and he would ask her to drive me home. After that, I started looking around for my phone but couldn't find it in the mess because of the party. Nathan told me that he would clean the room and we would probably find my phone. But he wanted me to eat first because it was already around 12. So we ate, but I noticed his brother didn't come out to eat too. I didn't say anything because I suppose he was just busy playing video games or just wasn't hungry. Later in the afternoon, Nathan went upstairs to clean the room where the party had taken place and I stayed downstairs watching TV. I was bored and started feeling stressed out on the fact that I lost my phone and that I hadn't seen his brother and his aunt hadn't come here yet. So I started looking in every room, but his brother wasn't here. When I wanted to go outside to check if his brother was out there, I saw every door in the window were closed and I started stressing out. Also, I was not hearing any cleaning sounds. Nathan heard the sounds of me trying to open the doors and came downstairs and told me that his parents told him to keep every door closed when he was alone. But he's not the type of guy that would listen carefully to his parents, so I started to doubt him, but I kept calm. While he was checking to make sure everything was closed, I went upstairs quietly and started looking for my phone again. But instead I found a backpack with not only my phone, one pad of sleeping pills, where two pills were missing, and ropes. You can't imagine how panicked I was. I had just enough time to take my phone before Nathan started coming up the stairs very quickly. He saw that I had my phone and started looking at me in a way that he never did before and tried to grab the phone from me and catch me. I was panicking, but thank God I had the idea of saying, if you try coming close, I'm calling the police. I ran as quickly as I could downstairs and ran into a window. I don't know what I did to be so lucky, but I punched on the window hard to make noises and the postman saw me and understood that I was in danger. I'm very lucky because in my country, postmen usually work in the morning and very rarely in the afternoon, around 4 p.m. Nathan saw that the postman saw me and stared menacing at Nathan to let me go and he did. So I ran as quickly as I could to the postman's car and asked him to drive me to the closest train station and he did. He also asked me if I wanted him to call the police, but I was in a state of shock and invented a story to make him stop worrying. I came to the police a few days later and they told me that I was probably drugged and that's why I was sick and so tired. I won't tell you about what happened next because of privacy, but I'm fine now and Nathan got what he deserved. So I'll just throw this one out there. In the early 2000s, when I was 4 or 5, my parents had just gotten a divorce and my mom started dating this guy. Anyway, my mom started seeing this guy and he would come to our house regularly. Things didn't seem bad at first, but he drank daily. This wasn't something I understood yet at my age. Let's skip to the bad stuff. So this guy wasn't too bad to my sister, who was 2 or 3 at the time, but he took some sadistic interest in hurting me. He arrived at our house almost every day, and the first thing he would do was take off his belt and start beating me with it. This had gotten to the point where I would hide if I knew he was coming. As for why my mother didn't leave him, he threatened to kill us if she did. Now this one incident that's burning to my memory. On a random day, he had found this nice little cardboard box. He picked me up and shoved me inside box and sat on top of it. My mom was doing the dishes so I assumed she couldn't hear me screaming for her as I peered out the box's handle holes at her back. Before he covered the holes with his hands, I screamed a good few minutes as his asshole just laughed about torturing me. The only reason why he got off the box was I had a small screwdriver in my back pocket that I used to stab him in his ass. This got him to fly off the box and pissed him off because he wasn't having fun anymore. He picked me up again and carried me off to my room where he proceeded to beat me with his belt. Then he left me in my room, after taking my lamp and locking my door. I was afraid of the dark, so I cried and screamed some more. 
I kept crying until he finally left and my mother came in and opened my door. The random beatings would go on until he eventually got into some trouble and ended up in jail. Sometimes I think maybe my mother called the police on him. He called my mom from jail and told her that if she found anyone else, that he would kill her, me, and my younger sister. We ended up moving three cities over, and as far as I know, my mom never heard from him again. This asshole is almost single-handedly responsible for several of my long-term phobias, and as an adult now, I'll kick his ass if I ever saw him again. So psycho asshole, for my sake and yours, let's never meet again. This started a little over two years ago, when I dated my ex. We'll call him John. He was abusive and cheated. I had issues at home, so I had to stay with him. It was an on and off relationship for three months. I broke up with him and moved on. I started dating my friend at the time, let's say Billy, still together to this day. But John didn't move on. He harassed me, my boyfriend, my friends and family for weeks. He called, texted, and even showed up to our apartment. He went as far to have his mom message me on Instagram. I got a harassment restraining order filed against him. Three days after John received the restraining order, he called me and proceeded to show up at my job. It took two weeks for the police to gather the restraining order paperwork before arresting him. He eventually went to court and pled guilty. For the next year and a half, he continued to message my Billy and my friends and occasionally talked about me. Then out of nowhere, he followed my boyfriend and I into a goodwill. I called the cops and after a couple weeks, there's now a warrant out for his arrest. My neighbor has seen him a few times outside of our apartment complex. He also messaged someone I know and tried to convince him to ask me to join a 308 with him. When he was called out, he claimed that it was a fake account. I am terrified to leave my apartment or go online. He won't leave me alone, even with the restraining order, and he also has a boyfriend. My ex JJ was a creep. I was with him for 19 months. This happened around two months into the relationship as he was just starting to get controlling and it terrified me. It was around 2 a.m. and I was in bed. I have super bad insomnia, so I was listening to YouTube and scrolling through Reddit, not expecting to sleep for at least a couple hours when I heard a tap on my window. I assumed it was my cat, so I called her name because he always meowed when she heard her name. It was silent and then tap, tap, tap. I turned my YouTube down and called out my cat's name again. I heard him meow in the bathroom and panicked. It wasn't her outside my window. So outside my window is the roof of the extension that was built. It slopes up to my window so it can easily be climbed onto via my neighbor's wood shed. At this point, I knew someone was out there, but I was too scared to look. I sent JJ a message about it, but he was asleep so it sent, but it didn't deliver. The tapping kept happening. Roughly every 20 seconds there would be a tap tap tap, and then the silence. It continued for about 45 minutes while I laid in bed just listening. I felt like I was stuck in bed, like if I came out from under the quilt, then they would somehow get me. After about an hour, I realized it stopped completely. I pulled myself out of my bed and went into my kitchen. From there, I could see the roof. I saw a pair of legs dangling over the edge, illuminated by a torch. I decided to give up with my room and I slept on the sofa with my cat that night. At least whoever it was wouldn't know where I was. Next thing I know, I'm waking up to my alarm. I go to turn it off and I notice I have a Snapchat from JJ, which is odd but not unheard of. They're from around 3.30 in the morning, so probably just after I fell asleep. I opened the snaps and my stomach dropped. It was a photo of my bedroom window from the outside, then one of legs dangling in my garden, and then one of me sleeping on the sofa 
taking through the kitchen window. I messaged him, asking him what the fuck he was doing. I got a reply saying that he came to my house to check on me and chase a guy off from my house. At that point, he had me convinced he could do no wrong, and if I opposed him, I was scared about what might happen, so I just left it at that. From then on, it happened a couple more times, and every time I would just try to ignore it. But with the joy of hindsight, I know I shouldn't have. I should have told someone and broken up with him, but I was too scared of what he might do. I have a lot of stories about JJ. I might write some more. I've been considering putting it into a book somewhere, but I'm not sure. My ex and I broke up about a year ago, and it got very messy. I was receiving DMs, texts, and Snapchats from what seemed like everyone from her hometown. I got everything from calling me names to death threats. I ended up having to block 10 people from 3 different sources of social media, but that's besides the point. The worst threat I received was from her recent ex. Oh, you hurt my girl? It's over for you. I know what town you live in. I will find you and when I do, your parents won't even be able to recognize your body. He also sent me several others, explaining the ways he would torture me. I just ended up blocking him, along with everyone else, and moved on with my life. Well, today, getting close to our one year of breaking up, my ex and I have started talking again and are on okay terms and everything seemed fine. I go about my day and walk over to this popular deli to grab a bite to eat and end up passing a friend of mine along the way. They shouted my name across the street and I head over. We talk for a bit and split ways and I head over to the deli. This is when I was approached by three taller guys. My fucking stomach hit the ground when I saw the guy's face. It was the ex-boyfriend. I knew instantly from having to stare at his profile picture and he brought friends to find me. He quickly grabbed my shoulder and tightly looked me in the eyes. I stared back into his and they seemed full of rage and instantly, I finally found you, he said in the probably the most calm voice as he continued to whisper, you know what I have to do to you now, I'm a man of my word. Every inch of my goddamn body began to crawl. Fight or flight was kicking in and time felt slow-mo. My brain was running a million miles per hour, three verse one. Okay, this isn't good, but they can't just kill me in broad daylight. Do they have a car? Oh God, are they going to kidnap me first? I started to look around for an exit. He then tightened his grip and said, Nobody's going to save you. This is when I booked it, full pedal to the metal. I knocked his grip off of me and watched the three guys try to grab me, but I was already gone. I ran as fast as I could. Thankfully, I know this area pretty well, so I took off towards the direction of my friend's apartment. They chased, and after screaming full-blown battle cries, I turned a corner, and by the luck of God, someone was exiting my friend's apartment building, which had a lock from the outside gate. I dashed in and slammed the gate behind me. I watched for about five minutes as they searched the nearby area for me, checking behind dumpsters. These guys were serious. I feel lucky to even be telling this event right now. This is one crazy motherfucker I hope to never meet again. So I matched with this girl on Tinder named Jenna. Jenna and I went on our first date on January 26th. She knew I was out of a long term relationship and still maintained occasional contact with my ex, Mary. Jenna and I officially started calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend around mid-February. Three days ago, while I was in a shower, she goes through my phone and reads old messages between Mary and I. A few casual ones, and a few very affectionate ones, before Jenna and I started seeing each other, or even met. Jenna packs all her things and is heading out the door when I get out of the shower, with my phone. She texts a bunch of people saying things like, I'm an asshole, and Mary is a manipulative bitch. She hacks into my Facebook and makes a post calling Mary a whole slew of names and blocks several of my friends. She does the same thing with Twitter. 
I get a hold of a coworker's phone and use it to try to contact her and sign back into my Facebook. Once she realized as I did, she changed my password and my email passwords as well. Eventually, she tells me she wants to talk this out and we meet at my place. I play along so I can get my phone and passwords back. She gives me my phone and makes me call Mary, telling her that I'm cutting her out of my life. I got a hold of Mary earlier and warned her that something like this might happen. We both have a background in theater, so we had a very convincing argument over speakerphone so Jenna could hear. Jenna gives me my passwords and I immediately change them. I tell her that she should leave and she doesn't understand why I want her out of my life. She goes home very upset about me breaking up with her over this. Jenna starts posting and commenting on Facebook and I block her. I block her on everything and she begins calling me over and over, not saying anything when I answer the phone. I block her number. I start receiving the same calls over and over again from a number in Colorado. I live in Canada. Eventually I go to my phone provider and change my number. I also change the locks on my door in case she took a key. Next day, she makes a Facebook post calling me a piece of shit and she hacks into my alt Twitter account. I tell her she calls me one more time or posts one more thing about anyone I know. I'm calling the police. So then I get an email that my application for a credit card with a bank I do not use has been approved. I call the bank and tell them what's happening and they froze the account. Several friends told me to call the police and I finally realized enough is enough. The police come and tell me that she has some sort of file with them and that her name isn't Jenna. It's something completely different. They issued a warning of harassment and if she tries to contact me again, I call the police and she'll get arrested. On Monday, I have to call the fraud people and get my accounts frozen and investigated and stuff. I realize this is a lot, but this is actually a pretty bare bones version of the story. Basically, the reason I'm posting this is now that the police got involved and I've had my locks changed and my number changed. I'm starting to feel emotionally damaged of being abused and harassed by someone I was actually starting to care about and I don't know how to deal with it. It's hard to pinpoint when this occurred, but every time I think it's finally over, I'm reminded it's not. Tate was my first ever boyfriend. This story is supposed to focus on things he did after we broke up, so I'll quickly gloss over what happened during our relationship. And yeah, I was really stupid back then, so brace yourself for cringe. Also, prepare for a lot of cursing. This is going to be a long and angry one. We started dating shortly before my 15th birthday. The whole relationship was a mess. He convinced me to steal money from my grandmother and run away with him. He cheated on me multiple times, got me pregnant, birth control failed, and dumped me for another girl, only to come crawling back to me after he coerced me into having an abortion. He also lied a lot, like a lot, but of course, I forgave him over and over again. The whole ordeal lasted 21 months before I finally had it and ended it once and for all. He frequently called me, sometimes in the middle of the night, often drunk or high. In a particular hilarious incident, he called me while getting pounded by another guy to let me know that he was getting pounded by another guy. He would also often pass by my house, sending me messages like, I see your mom still drives the same car. One time, he refused to leave until I came down and told him that I was done with him. I threatened to call the cops, which pissed him off. I eventually just blocked him everywhere I possibly could. I started dating again three months after our breakup. Her name was Emma. Tate somehow found out who I was dating and sent her fake screenshots of text messages that implied that I still loved him and wanted him back in an attempt to sabotage my new relationship. Lucky for me, Emma had a brain and quickly caught on to the fact that he was bullshitting her. Since I blocked him everywhere, he ended up messaging a friend of mine. He said that he's been stalking me and was threatening to kill her. 
I called the cops, but they just told me that they couldn't do much as long as it was nothing but messages on the internet. Emma is still alive and well, so it was all empty threats, but it was certainly enough for me to be terrified to leave the house for a few months. Emma and I eventually broke up. Once again, Taysom found out about that and decided to use the opportunity of me being single. Mind you, Emma and I had dated over two years, so Tate and I's breakup was more than two and a half years ago. I also found out later that he had a girlfriend and a son. He turned up on my doorstep at 5 o'clock in the morning. He messaged me from a new profile and demanded me to come downstairs to say goodbye because he was moving to LA. I'm from Europe, so not only would he need a visa, which requires a lot of money and could take several years to be approved, his English skills were also practically non-existent. He stood in front of my door, looking up at my window, smiling and waving. I told him to piss off or I was calling the cops, after which he went on a long rant about what a whore I was and how no one trusts him and really a lot of nonsense. I blocked the new profile and when I dared to take another look at the window 30 minutes later, he was gone. I really don't want to know what would have happened if I gone outside that day. That was three years ago, and I honestly thought that would be it. After all, our breakup happened almost six years ago now. A few months ago, though. Alright, backstory needed. I fell in love with someone online. He lives in America. We got married, and I moved to America. I decided to clean up my block list on Facebook. It had been such a long time. I didn't think much of it when I unblocked him. After all, I was married and lived halfway across the planet now. Not one month after I unblocked him, he messaged me in the dead of night, which would have been the same time in the morning for him. Hey, I was just about to stop by when I remembered that you live 5,000 miles away now. How's it going? I straight up have no idea how he knows I moved to America. Profile on Facebook is set to private. I had a mild anxiety attack, even though I knew he literally couldn't touch me. I don't want to talk to you, was my response. Are you sure? I'd like to know how it's going with your husband, and how is America? I replied, yes, I'm sure. I don't want to tell you about me, or my husband, or my life in America. I'm done with you. I've been done with you. Just leave me alone. His response was a one minute long voice message. I didn't listen to it because I didn't want to hear his voice. Instead, I forwarded it to a friend who listened to it for me. According to her, there was a lot of rambling. He apologized for the voice message, saying his cab driver had punched him, which leads me to believe that he was either drunk or high, again, and how he still likes me, and that he would love to stay in contact, and if I wanted someone to talk to, he'd be there. The rest was unintelligible, as there were sirens in the background. I never replied. Instead, I blocked him, again. Every time something like this happens, I think it's the last time. But at this point, it feels like I'll never fully get rid of him. My best friend and I, both female, and 16 and 17 at the time, went to the mall near her house and were walking around the normal stores we would check out. We saw this cute guy, 18 to 19, but I didn't know how to approach him since we were social outcasts. He must have noticed because he came to talk to us. After a month or so, I started dating him for about five months or so, and I'm introduced to pot and mushrooms. A few weeks to a month into the relationship, he tells me about a girlfriend he had back in Tennessee that cheated on him when he moved down south. He told me that he knew the Mexican mafia and, in great detail, how he wanted to kidnap both his ex and the guy she cheated on him with and their families and slowly torture and kill them. I thought he was joking until he got into lengthy details of injecting acid into veins, violent beatings, and body disposal. My parents picked me up after that. Not telling them what I learned, I just silently cried in the back of the car. He shows me his sword and knife collection shortly before I joined a D&D group that hosts at a store in the mall I live next to. 
After I joined, he becomes very upset and jealous and went as far as showing up during a session I was not present for and threatened him with some of his knives. I, of course, apologized to my group since I knew every one of them from my friend group at school. Not much later, he thinks that I'm pregnant and shows me a case from the FBI that included black gloves and weighted knuckles just in case he needed to force a miscarriage by beating me. I went to my best friend's house since she lived down the street. Her entire household of maybe 12 or so was waiting for me outside and her stepbrothers had the guns ready. We talked him down and he just took me to get the morning after pill. I don't remember what caused this, but at some point I sent him a lengthy message of, I'm sorry, and he made me bow to him the next time I saw him and say it as many times as I wrote it. He also threw something I gave him in the street and kept running after it, picking it up, running back to me just to throw it. I used to take the light rail every weekend to see him since it was right next to my school and it did right down the street from him. He once fell asleep when I was riding it and wouldn't answer his home phone or cell phone. I had to walk like two or three miles in the Arizona sun during midsummer to get to him since he was closer than my friend. After that, I started going to his house less and hanging out with my friends closer to home. He called me one day when I was hanging out with someone who shared the name with one of my D&D mates and he blew up. We basically ended our relationship over the phone and I hung up on him. I refused to answer his calls as well. He wound up apologizing and attempted to win me back. I refused and he started threatening driving into my house. I don't remember having any physical or visual interactions with him since. I don't think I would have been able to leave him if we didn't have that fight over the phone. I'm terrified of what would have happened if I managed to try to break up with him in person, or worse, if we had gotten married, which he mentioned while trying to win me back that he was going to ask me to marry him. I had another piece of shit boyfriend a few years later for about a year and it caused additional mental trauma. I don't want to go into too much detail really, but he would make me watch him punch himself in the middle of the head or bang his head against the wall. It was as if he was punishing someone else with how much he put into it. Both of these men could have easily done something terribly worse if their relationships had not ended. I refused to date anyone five years after that relationship. I wanted someone to connect with me and didn't change after we started getting physical. My boyfriend of the last two and a half years is aware of some of these details and is very understanding as to why I shut down during certain situations. He's been trying to help me open up to him since I only ever had one other normal relationship and hadn't had another person care for my feelings and opinions for a long time. He can tell when something's wrong and will keep asking me until I tell him since he knows I'll still shut down but want to open up to him. In the time I've been with him, I found myself crying with him beside me because I can't believe I found someone so sweet to me. It happened quite often at first. The crying that is, but it's since slowed down. Still happens though. He's been with me through so much. I had this boyfriend who would get really mean during sex. He would choke me harder sometimes out of nowhere and give me this weird look. He explained it to me as having multiple personalities and one of them was a woman in his head who he was dating who is jealous of me and wants to kill me and she comes out during sex and he's always arguing with her. I honestly tried to be there for him, but I was like 16 and now that I'm an adult looking back, this doesn't sound right. I remember after a small argument, he would sit in the corner holding his legs, shaking back and forth, catatonic for literally hours, but he really wasn't catatonic because if someone else would step into the room, he would suddenly snap out of it. He was as normal and charming as he could be in public and around his friends. This stuff would only happen when we were home alone. He would even write me letters in different handwriting and they'd either be nice or mean wanting to get rid of me. He's happily married now. I never heard of anyone else seeing him do this shit.
This happened about nine years ago. I was living with a roommate at the time in a townhouse in a suburb of Denver. My boyfriend at the time had always been kind of abusive with the occasional slap or pinning me down on the floor. But after a family member that he was close with committed suicide, he really lost it. My ex, Pierce, just lost it in the middle of an argument one day, about a week after the funeral, and threw me on the ground, punching my arm over and over. There was a giant bruise on one of my shoulders and a handprint-shaped bruise on the other. My face ended up being swollen, and I had a bloody lip. My roommate called the police, and he ended up being arrested. A no-contact order put in place. He was also ordered to go to counseling and maybe even drug and alcohol meetings even though at the time he didn't use. Fast forward a few months, I'm living with this roommate because I was completely financially dependent on peers. My roommate took it upon herself to pay for me to get my GED. That woman was a saint, I just needed to throw that out there. A lot of my time was spent studying for the subjects. After everything, I was very agoraphobic, but I managed to forge some online friendships and maybe even something more with a generally kind guy. One day, Pierce's grandmother stopped by to take me to pay my phone bill. She lived close by in the same townhouse complex and was more or less right behind where I lived. I remember it being the first beautiful and slightly warm day after a long winter, so I opened up all the blinds to let the sunlight in and left them open when I left. After paying my bill, Pierce started calling her. I wasn't too concerned because I knew he was supposed to be at his court-mandated counseling shortly. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but his grandmother told him that we just had to stop by at McDonald's. Again, not an issue at this point. I eat my Big Mac or whatever until maybe three minutes later, Pierce calls again. His grandmother tells him that she's probably going to be home in about 10 minutes. The call ends. I finish my food and we leave. Again in the car, about two minutes away from where I live, Pierce calls again. I still can't hear his side of the conversation, but his grandma tells him the intersection we just passed and suddenly, I have this terrible sinking feeling in my stomach. I know something's wrong, but I can't identify what, but I know in my heart of hearts that something was very wrong. I consider asking his grandmother for help, but for context, his grandmother on multiple occasions watched Pierce hit me or try to strangle me and openly expressed disgust at how I can't help but piss him off. The same lady that knew her daughter, Pierce's mother, broke Pierce's nose when he was six because he saw his mother flip off someone and copied her and did nothing to intervene or let her know that that wasn't okay. The family member Pierce was mourning for often told him that he was a fuck up and was probably the most verbally and emotionally abusive person I've ever witnessed in real life or movie, book, whatever. So this family is just super fucked and abusive to other people, to each other. So I'm completely alone in the situation. Anyway, his grandmother pulls up in front of where I live and I notice that all the blinds I had opened are now closed. We go inside and once she leaves, I walk upstairs to my room and see a random word document open on my computer. Pierce had written a whole page worth of shit, but I only pay attention to the words that are written on the top. I read your emails. Immediately, I know that he had seen the emails between me and the guy I met. Even though they weren't outright sexual or flirty, you could kind of tell there was something there. My brain stopped reading at this point, and I figured out that he's still in the building. Because there's a no contact order, I know he would have came in through the back door, so no one would see him. So my mind latches onto the idea that if the back door is locked, he's probably gone. I run downstairs to the door, and I see that it's locked. But as soon as I reach the door, I hear the closet sliding open from the room I was just in. Loud angry footsteps, and he's yelling my name. I know this may sound weird, but I can't recall exact details. I remember his face in mind before I could understand what was happening. I remember being back in that room again. I think they go through all my emails with him. I remember him slapping me hard in the face, over and over until I got dizzy. I remember somehow convincing him to let me use my phone to respond to one of my roommate's texts. I don't remember what I said, but I remember that she called right away. Pierce was standing two feet away from me and looking at me, believing that he was going to kill me and my roommate asking me, Are you safe? I said, 
No. She told me that she was on her way and that she would be there as fast as she could. Eventually, Pierce became convinced that I had called the police and with a knife in his hand, told me that if they were coming anyway, that he might as well give me what I deserve. I managed to convince him that I hadn't called the police and then he started crying about how terrible of a person he was and threatened to kill himself with the knife. So with a handprint on my swollen face, I reasoned with him, telling him that he wasn't terrible and to please not hurt himself all the time until my roommate came home. Insane ex-boyfriend, I've moved states, had my name changed, and only feel safe in buildings in big cities where I'm at least three stories up. Let's not meet ever again. Just want to start off by saying that the story occurs over a couple of years. It's been a long time and it's really hard for me to type this out because it makes me feel very anxious to this day. Some of the time frames are a bit cloudy for me. When I was 15 or so, my mother reconnected with an old crush of hers from her junior high school days, Wayne. Soon after, they started dating. At the time, I thought it was pretty cool because I actually went to school with his son, same grade as I was. Brandon. He had two other kids as well, both younger, James and Allie. I didn't actually see Wayne very much in the beginning, as he and my mom would often go out or hang out at his place. One night, I got a call from him sometime close to Christmas, asking what I would like for a gift, which I thought was strange because I barely knew the guy, but I just assumed that he was trying to get on my mom's good side, so whatever. He started coming around more, and I remember just something about him sent alarm bells off in my head like you wouldn't believe. He just gave me the freaking heebie-jeebies. Wayne moved in very soon into the relationship, and I just chalked up my uneasy feelings about him to him and my mom moving too fast in their relationship. Fast forward some time. My mom was working at a liquor store, and I was home alone with Wayne. I can't remember what this was over, but we got into a heated argument. I was young and full of teenage angst, so who knows. Next thing I know, he headbutts me, and I was so shocked, I didn't know how to deal. I told my mom, but nothing happened. Eventually, he managed to convince my mom to quit her job because he could financially support us. She also had back and knee issues, so she agreed. Then shit started to get fucking weird. I suddenly got a peeping Tom who would peer into my windows late at night in the summer. I would notice because I saw someone, or my neighbor would see someone. At one point, someone saw him taking pictures outside of my bedroom, not sure if I was home or not. The police were called, but of course, they can't do anything if they can't actually catch the guy. I was terrified. I'm so uneasy sleeping if windows are low. Wayne took action and convinced that he could take care of the family. Such a hero. He convinced my mom to get a security system, which cost a fortune, and that had to be paid monthly. He convinced my mom to get a dog, Coda, to keep us safe. Turns out, Wayne had hired people to look into my window. In the winter, I could see footsteps all the time that led to my window. I didn't learn that it was him until much, much later. I'm not even sure how we found out. He started getting physically abusive with my mom, me, and worst of all, poor little Coda. I would just hold her and cry because I felt so bad for her. We felt totally trapped financially and felt scared of whoever this dude was peering into the windows at night. We were scared. We were absolutely fucking terrified. One night, Wayne didn't come home. My mom called him over and over and over and he wouldn't answer his phone. When he did arrive home in the wee hours of the morning, his clothes were ripped. He was dirty as hell, covered in blood. Wayne claimed that he was mugged. Not long after this incident, homicide detectives show up at my house. When they did, he pushed me away and tells me that he will speak to them in private. When he returned, he comes up with a story about how it had to do with a neighbor of ours going missing and that they were just going door to door looking for any information and that they wouldn't be returning so there's no need to worry. A couple weeks after this, a truck was found abandoned and they found a body. There was a murder. The accused was a neighbor of mine. Honestly, it's never been proven, but there's no doubt in my mind that Wayne had something to do with it. Ah, and here's where we learn that Wayne has a crack addiction. 
He was a huge dude. You'd never guess by looking at him that he had an addiction to drugs. Hence, why it took us so long to figure out. It all came to a head one night. He and my mother started to argue. I heard banging come from the bedroom and I went in running to save my mom. I found my mother huddled in the corner in their tiny ass bathroom and him on top of her beating her. I screamed and grabbed at him, begging him to stop. He then turned on me, grabbing me by the neck, pushing me up against the wall by my neck and punched the wall directly beside my face. He let me go and I went running. He had purchased an old timey battle axe that happened to be sharpened and it hung on our wall. He grabbed it and started chasing us with the axe. I thought we were going to fucking die. Now just a note, my mother tried calling the police when they first started arguing, but they didn't come. As he was chasing us with the axe, I had dialed 911 on my phone. I was screaming, begging for them to come. In this whole mess, I don't know how he stopped or why, but he just left. Once the cops got there, he was already gone. He did eventually get caught and charged. We of course were summoned to testify in court. My poor mom was too scared to testify, so she refused. We still had to go to court though. We saw him in the courthouse and he gave my mom the most sinister fucking grin I've ever seen. He was pleased with himself. He felt no remorse. So honestly Wayne, I hope I am never so unlucky that I have to see you again. This story is about my dad's ex-girlfriend. My dad has horrible luck with women. He's like a crazy magnet. Every woman he has dated, except for his current girlfriend, have been abusive both mentally and physically. This list includes my mother. But this story is about his last girlfriend, Mary. She has gone from stalking not only him, but me, my husband, and our daughter too. They met at a Christmas party and hit it off. He had just gotten out of a bad relationship with a different woman that he had been on and off with for three years. She was the classic narcissist type. Well, Mary seemed different. She claimed she was also just getting out of an abusive relationship. They went out for a few months, but she never let my dad over to her place. He didn't find it weird at all until he received a call from a man who said Mary was his wife and wanted to know how my dad knew her. At first, my dad thought the guy was her ex, still trying to control her, but things started to add up. He finally confronted Mary and she gave him a sob story about how her ex refused to sign the papers, but they were separated. My dad did a bit of digging and even talked to Mary's parents at one point. He found out that not only was Mary definitely still married, but she wasn't separated from her husband. As far as everyone in her life knew, she was happily married. Needless to say, he broke up with her. She lost it, started showing up at his work, calling in the middle of the night, texting him 50 times a day, all that good stuff. My dad moved states twice and changed his number several times to try to get away from her, but she always found him. Love letters would arrive in the mail or she would call him and say that she was coming to see him. Then she found my phone number. Probably sometime after my dad moved in with me, she started texting me almost as much as him. Once I married my husband and had my daughter, she really went all out, sending me presents for her new granddaughter, always wanting updates, and even sent back the packages unopened or donated the items that she had sent directly to me from the shops. Everything finally came to a head when she arrived at my dad's doorstep while he was at work with a casserole for him. She gave it to his roommate and told him that it was because she noticed my dad was losing weight. He told my roommate to toss it. He didn't want to risk poison since he had just applied for a restraining order. One night, she showed up at my apartment while my husband worked the overnight shift. It was after 1am and she started knocking on my door. I was glad that I sent my toddler to my aunt and uncle's for the night. She left banana bread on my doorstep and we threw it out as soon as my husband got home. The next night, I again left my toddler with my aunt and uncle in case she came back. She did. I started getting texts from her as she pounded on my door. 
She wanted to see her grandbaby and have some girl time with me. It slowly turned into demands for me to open the door. I called the cops. While I was on the phone with dispatch, my neighbor came out ready to take her on. He told her that cops were on their way since his wife was already calling them. She disappeared real quick into the park across the street. The cops didn't catch her, but my dad's restraining order did get granted. We have since moved across the state, but she still texts me from time to time, wanting to know how my dad is or what my daughter is up to. I have never answered, but I do save all her texts just in case I need to get my own restraining order as well. This event requires a bit of backstory. In early 2014, my best friend Lily met a guy named Nathan at a club through one of her friends from her college. She and Nathan instantly hit it off and were officially dating within a few weeks. It only took a few months for Lily to fall head over heels for this guy. Before long, she was even telling me that she thought he was the one. I was happy for her experiencing some good old college romance. It eventually led to her losing her virginity to this guy. I really had no opinions of this guy, aside from what I heard from Lily. From what I heard at first, he sounded like a nice guy who just had a lot of bad stuff happen to him. This guy had some serious baggage. He had a poor background and lived with his grandmother. I can't remember if he ever told Lily about his parents or not. He had a three-year-old son named Isaac, whose mother was a drug addict. Lily was in love with Nathan so much that she was willing to stick with him and help him with some of the drama. In spite of hearing so much about him, I only met him twice. Once when he picked up Lily from work, we work at the same place, and the second when, I'll get to that. However, things first went downhill when Nathan broke up with Lily in September. He had recently become a rookie police officer and was moving to another city for more training. He said he would come back for her. Still, Lily was devastated by this, but unexpectedly, he was back in town within a month. This whole episode fell off to me. Lily and Ethan tried to start things up again, and things were starting to look up for the couple. That is until Christmas rolled around. In something straight out of a soap opera, Lily broke up with Nathan on Christmas after finding some damning information about him. After he broke up with Lily in September, he apparently went and slept with one of his cousins and got her pregnant. His cousin later had a miscarriage. And to add to that, Nathan revealed that he had both chlamydia and genital herpes. He knew he had both of these yet purposely didn't tell Lily in order to have lots of unprotected sex with her. Lily got herself tested. While she didn't contact chlamydia, she tested positive for genital herpes. As expected, she was devastated by this and went through a brief period of depression. It quickly became apparent that Nathan was not the type of person Lily thought he was. He was sexist, a womanizer, a cheat, and a liar. He had sex with multiple women and, just like Lily, he kept the information about his STDs a secret. He even tried to turn all his friends against Lily, saying that she broke up with him, and even tried to drive apart Lily and Yasmina the fiancé of one of Nathan's cousins who was now close friends with Lily. Lily didn't stand for this and made sure the truth was known. She talked to Yasmina and her fiancé about it and they eventually kicked Nathan out of their place. Word began spreading around Nathan's community about his wrongdoings and even his backup girlfriend broke up with him. It wasn't long before Lily was taking self-defense and gun classes. Nathan knew where she lived and obviously had some weapons training due to being a rookie police officer, a job he soon lost. She often told me that she was somewhat afraid of him, and mostly she was furious. If he ever tried to hurt her, I'm sure she would have blown his brains out. Anyway, my second and final encounter with Nathan was at the tail end of this drama earlier this year. My first encounter with Nathan had been brief, but afterwards, Lily had told me that Nathan had been initially jealous of me due to the fact that I was a close guy friend. We were friends since toddlers. While our first encounter was brief and under friendly terms, our second encounter was far from that. I had a morning shift at work that day and had just ended my shift. 
It was early in the afternoon, so I was hurrying up to my car to get out of the heat. As I walked to my car, I quickly noticed Nathan leaning against the car a few rows away. As you expect, I was furious upon seeing him, given all the crap he had caused my friend. I assumed that he was waiting for Lily or something. I only chuckled because Lily was on family vacation in Montana at the time. I decided not to confront him. I was always keen on listening to Lily and gave him my two cents but, for the most part, I had been successful at staying away from the drama. Suddenly, Nathan turned in my direction and immediately stood up completely. He tapped on his car and, who I assumed was a friend of his, stepped out. They began to power walk in my direction. Wasting no time, I jumped in my car, start the ignition, and pulled out of my parking spot. As I did, I heard a loud knock on the back of my car. I looked in the rearview mirror to see Nathan punching the back window in some attempt to stop me. I kept going. I was almost out of the parking lot when I looked in my rearview mirror again to see his car speeding in my direction. I sped out of the parking lot with him right on my tail. He continued to follow me for several streets. There was no way I was heading home with him following. I ended up taking the craziest detour in my life, pulling on and off feeders, driving through parking lots, driving circles in neighborhoods. I did it all. Eventually, after about 25 minutes of me driving, I lost him. I drove around a little while afterwards in order to make sure I had officially lost him. When I got home, I called Lily and told her everything. She thought about calling the police, but before we could decide on whether or not to do that, Lily got a call from Yasmina, who had been spying on Nathan for Lily for quite some time. We learned that Nathan had apparently packed up all his stuff from where he was living and had taken off. He was gone. To where, I don't know. I heard rumors of him wanting to go to New York City and Mexico, but those are the only possibilities I remember. All that matters is that he's now officially out of Lily's life. I'm not sure what would have happened if he caught me that day. Lily's guess is that Nathan might have been trying to hurt me in order to get back at her. I'm glad I was a good enough driver to lose him. Otherwise, I don't want to think about what he could have done to me. This is going to be a bit long, so I had this best friend in high school named Lena. We were friends for about a year and a half and we would spend almost every weekend at our house listening to music, watching scary movies, and gossiping. She was just a little bit crazy, the type of girl to beat up her boyfriend's exes, unprovoked. She actually did that once, and catfish people. I say we were best friends, but actually it was more like I looked up to her, and she liked that she could boss me around and hang out with me whenever she pleased. She was extremely manipulative and two-faced. She had a hobby of being nice to girls at school, then going on their social medias and making fun of everything they posted. She would befriend people just to get information from them. When we were friends, Lena was dating this guy named Nolan. They dated for about a year and a half and had lots of troubles for the last six months or so. He would go out drinking most weekends and she would cry in the middle of the night and blow up his phone, yelling at him and making him feel guilty. She was borderline psychotic when it came to his exes or girls that he was friends with and they just weren't really working out but they stayed together anyway. At some point, Nolan got Lena pregnant. At the same time, one of Lena's friends, whose name was Autumn, became pregnant from the guy I was in love with. Naturally, I wanted nothing to do with Autumn but because they were both pregnant together, Lena started hanging out with Autumn most weekends and neglected our friendship. After about a month, I became fed up with it and started ghosting her. At first, she tried to apologize, but I was not having it. Since the other girl was dating the guy I had been in love with for two years, and I was jealous and childish. So eventually, Lena got pissed at me and stopped trying. A few months went by and Lena had the baby. Nolan and Lena stayed together to take care of their son, but their relationship was absolutely horrendous at this point. She cheated on Nolan and he decided he wanted out of the relationship but continued to see his son and buy things for him. However, Lena and Lena's mother made things very difficult for him. 
By constantly changing the days he could see his son and refusing to let him take his son anywhere besides Lena's house. Lena's mother would also throw out Christmas presents from Nolan, ignore his phone calls, and eventually told him he wasn't allowed at her house. Nolan begged for months to see his son, but it was clear that Lena and her mother didn't want him in the picture. He offered to pay child support, but they didn't want that either. They just wanted him gone, so he stopped trying. Apparently, even that wasn't what they wanted. Lena took to social media to talk about how Nolan was a deadbeat. She told everyone that she knew that being a single mother was really hard and that the baby daddy refused to take care of his kid. A year after they broke up, I met Nolan in person. We had been talking online for a couple months about Lena. We had shared stories about her crazy meltdowns and her manipulative tendencies. And we talked about the time that he came to her house while I was there and attempted to scare her by jumping out when she went out the front door, but instead accidentally jumped out at me. He thought that was the funniest thing ever, that my face stayed stone cold, and I just said, sup. We had a similar sense of humor, and at the time, I had no one. I had just come out of one of the worst depressive episodes of my life. It had lasted for a good year, and I had dropped out of high school, been doing drugs, isolating myself for weeks at a time, and considering suicide. He was the one to help bring me back from the brink. He was kind, and he was my support system. We were just friends at first. When Lena caught wind of our friendship, she reached out to me. At this point, we hadn't been friends for a year and a half. We caught up and talked about what had been happening in our lives. She asked me what was going on with Nolan, and I told her that we were just friends. Everything seemed fine. That's when her erratic behavior started. She randomly blocked me on social media, then unblocked me a month or two later. Sometimes we would talk, like, how are you? Everything good? And the next day, I'm blocked. At one point, I asked one of her friends to get her to tell me why she was doing it because I was so confused. So she unblocked me and told me that she was salty about the situation with Nolan and the fact that I was friendly with him. I asked her why she keeps making up with me and then suddenly gets pissed off again and cuts me off. I told her that I'm tired of thinking things were good only to turn around and pretend like we never said anything to each other. That's when she said she could block me again or keep me unblocked. Whatever I wanted was fine. But she felt I had done her wrong by abandoning her during her pregnancy and befriending her ex-boyfriend. I tried to explain to her that Nolan was my friend. I tried to tell her that Nolan was all I had in my darkest time of my life. I tried to tell her why her neglecting me for Autumn hurt my feelings, but she wasn't having it. I understand where she was coming from, I do, and I acknowledge the fact that I acted childishly and in a cruel way, but I tried to make up with her multiple times. I tried really hard, and she couldn't even stick with whether she forgave me or not, so I told her to block me again, and I was done with it. She told me she wouldn't block me again, and that she gave me her blessing with Nolan. She said it was fine if we wanted a date, and that she hoped that I had a good life, and I said the same to her, and I really meant it. We had a bad end, but I was glad we could at least wish each other well. It was a few months after I last spoke to her that Nolan and I started dating. I had waited so long because I was worried about Lena, even though we weren't friends anymore. But she had given me her blessing, and she was dating someone else new, so I went with it. It was around this time that I received a friend request from a girl on Facebook named Casey. Casey said she lived in the big city in my state, and since we had mutual friends, and I had gone to school in that city, I assumed that we had gone to school together and I just didn't remember her. She seemed like a real person. She claimed to work at Hooters, had made posts about how her workday went, had several pictures of the same girl, made frequent posts about her ex-boyfriend. I accepted the friend request and she messaged me telling me how pretty she thought I was. I thanked her and told her to message me anytime she wanted to chat. For the next few months, I was clueless. I went about my regular life, posting about the things Nolan and I did, getting my GED, hanging out with friends, visiting my mother, etc. Occasionally, I would see strange posts on my timeline from Casey, but didn't think much of it because I had over 1,000 friends on Facebook and I rarely saw them. They were mostly posts about how much she hated her baby daddy 
and how her line of work sucked. But there were two posts in particular that caught my eye. One was a post that seemed to be referencing something I had posted the day before. Another one was of her saying, We all know a dirty whore named, with my first name in the blank. So I went through her profile, then clicked through months and months of posts. Some were about her line of work. Everything else was related to me and Nolan. Everything. There were posts of her complaining about her deadbeat baby daddy buying things for everyone but his kid. Posts about how sad she felt about the breakup. Posts about how she missed me and thought of me as a sister. Which is bullshit and I'll explain why later. Posts about how I stole her boyfriend. Also bullshit. She made fun of my hobbies. Had directly referenced some of my posts. Talked about how much she hated me. Said I was a dirty hoe. She even had people in the comments egging her on and talking shit too. Even though no one knew who she was talking about. But I did. She mentioned things that only the two of us knew. She referenced our past experiences. It was undoubtedly Lena. I messaged Casey and told her I knew she was Lena. She played dumb and told me that the initials were of another girl she knew. When I looked up the name she gave me, not a single person on Facebook had that name. When I told her that, she brushed it off and tried to get me to talk shit about Lena. So I played along and talked hardcore shit. I lied about a lot of things in an attempt to get her out of herself, but in the end, all she did was send screenshots of her conversation to Lena's account in an attempt to make it look like Casey was real and was trying to help Lena out by showing her what kind of person I was. Casey then immediately deleted her account. She didn't block me, she deleted it. I had a friend in my dad check and neither of them could find Casey's profile. So another month went by and I found out that she had reactivated the account and because I couldn't block a deleted account, she was in my friends list again and had access to my file for who knows how many days. So I blocked her. She then sent me a friend and follow request on three different websites under Casey's name, which I also blocked. It was around this time that Nolan and I began to get a lot of friend requests from obviously fake accounts. We would often report them and block them and try to pretend that she wasn't going insane. One of these fake accounts was extremely obvious because it poked both me and Nolan on the same day at the same time. She was taunting us I guess. I blocked that account too. Please be aware that at this time Lena was now married. She was doing this while married to someone else. A year later I thought this all had stopped and one day I went to the Casey account on my friend's Facebook because I wanted to see if she was still posting about me. And when I scrolled down, I realized I had missed a post last time. This post was Lena mocking the fact that my mother, yes, my birth mother, called her frequently to talk shit about me and give her information about me and Nolan. Turns out, my mother and Lena went to the same college, and my mother thought what better way to make friends than helping someone stalk her daughter. She'd ask me about mine and Nolan's relationship often, she talked shit about Lena and would act like the perfect mother to my face. She didn't raise me, so I didn't trust her 100%. For that reason, I never gave her my phone number or address or any other information that I felt was private. When my dog went missing, she tried to convince me to post my address on Facebook. She kept saying how important it was that people knew exactly where he went missing from. What horse shit. Thank God I didn't, because it might have woken up to Lena punching me in the head, or worse. For a while there, I was legitimately paranoid. Every time I went to the store or outside, I was watching my surroundings closely. If Lena was willing to beat the shit out of a girl Nolan had dated for three weeks, unprovoked, what would she do to me now if she saw me in public? Would she kill me? I never met someone so obsessed. Let me just say that Lena was a horrible friend. She was bossy, judgmental, rude, erratic, narcissistic, and two-faced. When I felt my first heartbreak, she spent all night talking shit about the guy, saying I deserved better. Eventually, I talked shit with her to make myself feel better. And what does she do? She messages him on Facebook and tells him everything I said about him. She guilt tripped me about having other friends. She convinced me to abandon one of my friends just because she didn't approve of her. She would ignore me when there were other people around. If I complained about anyone, she would go tell that person what I said even if she said something worse about them. 
she would go through people's Facebook and laugh at them and talk about how dorky they are. She'd make me feel ridiculous for liking the things I did and I never felt like I could be myself around her. It amazes me how many people Lena has manipulated. Even her poor husband probably doesn't know that she's a stalker. So yeah, there you have it. Lena cyberstalked me for two years and if I had given my mother my address, it might have become actual stalking. She hasn't been trying to stalk me for a while now. I cut my mother off and deleted about 40 people off my Facebook and made all my social media accounts private to keep this from happening again. I'm hoping I won't ever hear from Lena again. The last obvious sign I had gotten of her still trying to stalk me is a fake account she requested me on about three months ago. An account that was actually a few months old had the same last name as my friend and only like two Facebook pages of which was a grocery store and the other was my page. Anyways, if you finished this, sorry for such a long story. I was young when all this stuff happened and I made some really dumb choices, so go easy on me please. I know I'm not 100% faultless in this and yes, me and Nolan are still together and we'll be celebrating our fourth year anniversary in a couple months. When I was 23, I was running my first place when my ex-girlfriend reached out to me. We had dated for a few months in high school. It just went bad because I was a douche and started talking to another girl. It had been 10 years since high school. Anyway, my ex said she was over what happened when we were teenagers and was willing to give it another shot. So we have a date and then several dates and things were going very well. So about a month into our relationship, I'm at work on the late shift and she calls me saying she had gotten into an argument with her mom that had turned into domestic violence. Saying something about how she got slapped and needed to cool off at my place. I get home and turns out she was moving in. I'm pretty laid back and wanted help with the rent anyways, so I'm somewhat okay with it. I mean, I knew I was walking into a snake pit but I didn't know it was going to be a viper pit. So we lived together for a whopping two months when things take a turn. She starts telling me that she's insecure about me talking to girls, then changes to watching porn as well. We start fighting a lot, sometimes even all night long. She then starts cutting herself, saying it was my fault, and ends up getting tetanus. Late night phone calls asking where I am at work and who I'm with. I work late night hours at an ambulance service. Things come to a head one night when my crazy ex tries to tell me that looking at porn is the same thing as beating her. She starts screaming at me for bringing up the cutting and the doctor's visits claiming it's all my fault. I get fed up and tell her to move out. This pushes her off the deep end. She grabs my handgun that I keep for self defense, tells me that she's going to kill me then herself. I call the police and she leaves shortly afterwards, throwing my loaded handgun outside. I think, yay, it's over, but it wasn't yet. So a few days go by without incident, then my crazy ex texts me something, saying that she needed to give me her house key. I tell her no, to throw it away, but she drives by my house anyway, leaving the key and tapes a note on my door, saying I'm mentally ill and that I need help and she forgives me, blah blah blah. I stopped reading after the I need help part. She keeps texting me and texting me, asking if I read it, even going as far as blaming her behavior on a pregnancy, saying that the baby was mine, but she lost it due to stress. So here I am years down the road, married with a wonderful two-year-old, with no regrets of leaving that crazy ex. Let's not meet ever again. I have never really posted here before, but let me state that this happened to me years ago. My mom and I are both far away from this creepazoid and we'll never ever see him again. It happened back in 2011, maybe 2012. My mom had recently broken up with this guy who I thought was someone that could be a better father than my actual one was, but he broke it off from my mom and moved away. At the time, it was heartbreaking. But my grandmother had the genius idea of hooking my mom up with this guy when the relationship with the last one ended. The man named Bobby was, well, a redneck. 
And don't get me wrong, rednecks, hillbillies, and the like can actually be really kind and hardworking people. Bobby was not. Bobby was cruel, stupid, lazy, an alcoholic, and an all-around creep. I could not trust him no matter how many times my mom tried to get me to see the good in this asshole. He was racist towards a man who was just trying to make a living as a delivery driver. The poor guy is of Middle Eastern descent and Bobby berated and yelled at this guy, shouting, Go back to your own country. And how did this upstanding man defend his racist behavior? By stating that his cousin was killed whilst in the military, and that's why he acted like a prick. In the words of one of my close friends, your cousin died protecting the Middle Eastern man's rights as a U.S. citizen as well. Another thing that Bobby had done was during my 19th birthday party, he overheard me talking to my friends about my sexuality. I'm panned for the record, and after, he demanded I kiss one of my friends to prove it. He went on and on about how sinful I am, and that the Bible says this, that, and the other thing. On top of that, earlier... One of my friends who was 15 at the time had dealt with Bobby leering at her while dancing as if she were a stripper at a strip club. It took my mom a while to be rid of him and it took them fighting and him calling her a whore because she was a teen mom. My mom was 14 when she had me to finally kick this creep out of the house. This guy made me angry and afraid and even caused a rift between my mom and I. We have repaired our relationship somewhat, but Bobby did his damage. The last time I heard from him is when an ex of my uncle had a run-in with Bobby and he asked about his daughter's location. Confused, my uncle's ex inquired who he was talking about and he replied with my name. She flat out said, she's not your daughter. To Bobby, if there's an off chance that you're reading this, you are computer illiterate anyway. I doubt you would. I'm not your daughter. You are a racist, disgusting pig who took advantage of my mother's loneliness. And let's not meet ever again. Since this happened several years ago, I might get some parts mixed up or some events I may have forgotten. So I'll try to retell my experience the best I can. Bit of a backstory. When I was a little kid, my mom and I would visit my grandparents and all go to church together. I had a friend at church who I was super excited to visit every time I went. We would talk a lot about Pokemon and stuff we liked in general. Around this time, I started puberty and he seemed to be attracted to me. He would hug me and ruffle my hair. He was a big guy and always wore the same yellow shirt. It seemed innocent for a while, and we sort of had a relationship for a few months. Everything was good up until we were dating. I was probably around 16, and he was several years older than me. He one day confided in me that he could see angels, and that he was given a sword from Jesus to fight the demons. Yes, he really said that. As stupid as I was, I believed him. I don't know why, but I did. The times where I wasn't visiting, we would talk over stream where we played TF2. He would tell me all these stories of fighting demons and would talk to me through his angel and it got so much weirder. He would tell me how I would be his princess in heaven and that we would rule together. That's around the time I started getting uncomfortable and weirded out whenever he would go to hug me and try to go further with me. At one point, I tried to cut ties with him and break up. He would not have it one bit. He would constantly send me messages on email begging me to come back and how I was making a bad choice by leaving him. The last time I ever came in contact with him was also the last time I went to that church. My mom, little brother, and I all had to go to church for a small get-together for my grandma's birthday party. Knowing that my ex's family caters church events, I knew in my gut that he was probably going to be there. My mom told me not to worry about it when I knew something was going to happen. When we arrived, I told my mom that I was going to go to the room where the little kids played and where I knew it would be safe while we waited for the cake. I had brought my DS to distract myself and sat down to play. All of a sudden, I felt like someone was looming over me, a big presence. I knew it was him. 
I instantly went into flight mode and ran and hid around the church until he stopped following and looking for me. My mom and my brother instantly took me back to the house after I came out of hiding and I never went back to that church. When we visit my grandparents now, I stay back at the house while everyone else goes to church. My mom occasionally goes to church with them and sometimes encounters him. He sometimes tells her weird cryptic shit. Sometimes I just want to go back and just tell him to never talk to my family ever again. When we first met, you told me that you did not have any like-minded person with you as a friend. We were all in a new place, and I was away from my parents for the first time, and yet I was consoling you, a much older woman, who had been away from her parents for three or so years. You started hanging out with me when your so-called friends ditched you. We quickly became best friends, then you started showing me your true colors. You started screaming, shouting, and insulting me to the core if I disagreed with something that you said. You always wanted me to talk about you and sing your praises all the time. If I was sick, you never turned to look at me, and yet you were a good friend, and me being the only person who helped you with each and everything when you broke your leg was a bad friend? While taking you to the doctors when you were sick, you hurt me with the words repeatedly pricking me and tearing me apart. You were the only person to know about my panic attacks and the only person to call me attention seeker because of it. You thought I was flirting with a guy who you thought had a crush on you and you called me a whore for it when he was just helping me during a tough spot, something that you refused to do all the time. You told me to stay away from your friends. You insulted my mom on her parenting. Every assignment of yours, no matter how tired I was, I had to do them. Everyone saw it. Everyone called me your slave. But all you cared about was you. You took it out on me when your crush started dating someone else. And I took it. When you got a boyfriend allegedly, I was the last one to know. And you didn't even show me his picture. And when I got a boyfriend, you went around and told others how I am too young to be committed. You even told me not to talk to you about my relationship. You isolated me from literally everyone, badmouthed me, called me a flirt, all while laughing and joking with me. You literally put me in all sorts of uncomfortable situations, including making me beg for you to talk to me when you gave me the cold shoulder for something you had done in front of people that I hate. You enjoyed this. And at last, when I cut you out of my life, you were surprised how it was you who was alone. He claimed how I don't have friends, but darling, you're the one that went home without anyone bidding you a goodbye. It's been a year already, and I still have friends whom I ignored once upon a time, for you. To the people who asked me why I was with you, and also if you happen to read this, I know you won't, but if you do, and you wonder why I was with you for a year, it was because I thought of you as a sister, and I generally loved you regardless of what you did. I trusted your words, ignoring your actions, and as silly as it sounds, somewhere in my heart I still love you, but I can't forget how you turned me into a completely different person. Lack of trust, paranoid of people, lack of self-love, and self-confidence. I'm only a shadow of what I used to be. To the ex-best friend who manipulated me, brought out the worst in me, and gave me issues that I have to deal with for the rest of my life, I love you but please let's not meet again. This story I'm about to tell you happened over a course of roughly five or six years. Names have, of course, been changed. When I was in college, I met this dude named Steve. He was good looking, well-spoken, and confident. He was instantly well-liked by most of the people that he met but was a bit intimidating to me at first due to the fact that he was pretty jacked and didn't speak to me a whole lot in the beginning. Here I was, an 18 going on 19 fat kid with an inferiority complex that made me act out to get attention. I would wear women's clothes to class to get a laugh or interrupt the professor with a witticism here and a joke there. Again, for a laugh. I was that kid, 
the one that people didn't exactly dislike, but weren't too eager to hang out with, because I could be a bit much at times. This did nothing to help me with my feelings of inadequacy, but I didn't make the connection there until a couple years later. Steve and I didn't exactly become fast and hard friends, because I got pretty drunk at a party once, and he decided instantly that I was annoying. Still, we were civil to each other as we were in the same department and had a couple classes together. We kind of hung out with different crowds too, even inside the department. Steve had recently been kicked out of boot camp in the military. He told everyone that it was because he injured himself badly enough that he had been discharged, but that wasn't true. However, we'll get to that part later. Cut to about three or four months after my first meeting with Steve, and I had been invited by a mutual friend, Corey, to a small get-together at his place, where he incidentally was roommates with Steve. I told Corey that I was kind of weary of Steve and felt like he didn't like me, to which he replied that I was right, and that's why he wanted me to come over. He wanted me and Steve to get to know each other better because he was positive that we would become friends if we just gave each other a chance. After some more prodding, I finally agreed. When I arrived at Corey's house, there were maybe three other people from our department there. It seemed like a pretty chill setting. There was some alcohol being passed around, and I drank a little bit, but I kept my distance from Steve. After a couple hours and quite a few beers, I started to feel pretty good. Someone brought out a couple of joints, and those started getting passed around the room. When one of them made its way to me, Steve spoke up. Don't bother passing it to him. He's a goody good. I'm not exactly sure why he said that, or even thought that. It might have been because I mentioned in passing that I never smoked weed before. Regardless of why he said it, it made me mad that he was making fun of me. So I did what any 19 year old drunk dude would do. I grabbed the joint and took the biggest hit I could possibly take. This, as anyone who has smoked weed knows, is a huge mistake for a marijuana virgin when quality kush is handed to them. After my coughing fit and all the laughter at my expense has subsided, I looked at Steve challengingly and he kind of nodded in my direction before resuming his conversation. Now, no one told me that you shouldn't mix alcohol and weed. Had I stopped there, I would have been fine. However, I continued to drink, which exacerbated all the stuff that comes along with being high. By the time I knew I was high, I started getting paranoid. Dry mouth felt like my tongue was swelling up and my throat started to close. The feeling of almost weightlessness that sometimes accompanies being high made me feel like I wasn't anchored to the floor anymore. The time dilation that you would experience from weed made me feel like I was literally frozen in time. I started to panic. By this point, everyone else had gone home, and it was just me, Steve, and Corey. I explained to Corey that I thought I was allergic to the weed, because I wasn't feeling right. And oddly enough, Steve asked me to explain what I was feeling. When I did, he walked me through all of it, and calmed me down. Once I was calm, he put a controller in my hands, and we played video games until I sobered up enough to drive. It was honestly really cool of him, and it was the start of one of the best relationships I've ever had, until it became the worst, most abusive relationship. Over the next year or so, Steve and I became really close. I considered him one of my best friends. Being around him was almost like a drug. He just had this way of making you feel like you mattered. I know now that he was a complete psychopath, but you don't really see those signs until it's too late. He harassed me until I started working out with him, which meant I had the energy and confidence in myself. I got into pretty decent shape. I wasn't ripped. I wasn't even what most people would call fit, but I wasn't the fat kid anymore either. He would come to my house and force me to go out and do stuff. Before I had became friends with him, I was kind of a loner and a hermit. We would go to the lake and just dick around or go hiking in the woods or any number of outdoorsy type of activities. For the first time in years, I had confidence in myself, and I was actually quite happy. Enter Lisa. Lisa was the love of my life, the one that got away, 
or rather the one that I stupidly dumped twice over a five year relationship because I was scared. She's not a huge part of this ballad to Steve, but she played a role. She had came to my hometown to go to school and she had a boyfriend back home, but we clicked immediately. I know if you're wondering, and no, we didn't hook up or anything when she was with him. She made her attentions towards me clear, and I made it clear that nothing would happen while she was dating someone else. She told me that she had been considering breaking things off with him as he was a bit controlling and dickish. And then the next day she walked up to me and kissed me full on the mouth, and when I started pushing her away she laughed and said, I broke up with Jason last night, you're mine now. I smiled back and our relationship began. I apologize for getting into details that have nothing to do with Steve. It was just an immensely happy time of my life and I would have never had the confidence to flirt with Lisa in the first place if it weren't for Steve. The next year after Lisa and I got together was rather uneventful. I will admit that there were some red flags with Steve that either I didn't see or just outright ignored. Looking back on it now, one of the most obvious was the one day I was hanging out with Lisa when Steve showed up. She had always gotten a bad vibe from him, rightly so, and so when he showed up, she left to go to class 45 minutes early. Watching her walk away, Steve said, I could take her away from you if I wanted. I gave him an incredulous look, slightly panicking that the man who called himself my friend might actually want to and be able to sway Lisa to date him instead. He laughed at my expression and added, Don't worry, I don't want her. She's a six at best. She's perfect for you, but I like my bitches a little thinner and much hotter. Just thought you should know that if I wanted, I could take her away from you. It should be noted that Lisa was thin, if curvaceous, and absolutely gorgeous in a very classical way. I am now convinced that Steve was actually attracted to her, but he saw himself as an alpha and needed to assert his dominance over me, one of his perceived betas. I'm ashamed to admit that it worked. I did get angry and told him not to talk to or about my girlfriend in such a gross manner. But once he gave me a half-hearted apology, I kind of shrugged it off. The next year, there were even more red flags that I chose to ignore. I know this story is moving rather quickly now, but those first couple of years weren't really that bad. Yes, Steve started showing his true colors, but the really horrible shit was still to come. Also, if you're keeping track, I was at a two-year college for three years. That's just how long it took me to get my associate's degree. That's neither here nor there. Steve started dating one of the freshmen in our department. I heard from others that the relationship was incredibly psychologically abusive on his end, but I kept brushing it off because the girl he was dating hadn't spoken up and Steve was a good guy, right? I mean, I hadn't witnessed it. Other people must just be misinterpreting Steve's unusual sense of humor in a way that painted him in a bad light in their minds. I was unaware at the time that, of course, she wouldn't speak out against him because that's what psychological abuse is. It's gaslighting and insults and ensuring that the victim believes themselves to be absolutely worthless and deserving of treatment that they receive. During the end of year department party, I proposed to Lisa and she said yes. When Lisa and I graduated from college with an associate's degree, we decided to move to a new school together. Despite the fact that our relationship grew stronger than ever without Steve in our lives, a dot that I did not connect due to still being firmly in his psychotic grasp. The college we decided to transfer to was absolute garbage and after the year was over, we decided to transfer again to a better and cheaper school, this time about an hour away. Coincidentally, it was the same school that Steve was now attending. That summer, Lisa moved back to her hometown while transitioning between schools and I ended things with her for the first time over the phone. Shitty, I know but we were like five hours apart since I stayed behind to live on campus and work and neither of us could find the time to visit each other. The only reason I can logically come up with is that I was scared of the commitment. I always said that when I marry, I want to be in it for life. 
I got in my own head and started worrying about whether or not Lisa was the person I really wanted to spend the rest of my life with. When I moved to the new city, Steve helped me get an apartment in the same complex where he and Corey, the friend from earlier, both lived. We were in separate buildings, but the apartments were set up in a way that the courtyard between the two buildings was only like 40 feet across. I could actually see into Steve's basement apartment window from the second floor when both of our blinds were open. There were many times I would glance out the window while playing video games or something, and Steve would catch my eye and wave me over. So I would obediently turn off my game and head over to his place to smoke a little weed and watch one of his four DVDs for the billionth time. During this time of my life, I became a major alcoholic. I'm fairly certain that Steve realized this was happening but said nothing because he wanted to be able to hold it over me later. He may have contributed to my alcoholism a little bit. He began to use the same bully tactics he had once employed to get me to work out and go do things. This time, he was using them to get me to go out drinking. If I told him that I had class early the next day or homework that needed to be done, he would just wave it off and tell me that we would be back in plenty of time for me to get my homework done or plenty of time to sleep. We would often stay out until 2 in the morning when the bars closed or later if we met someone cool and decided that we were going to hang out at their house for a little bit afterwards. If I said I didn't have the money, he would promise to pay for me. At the end of the night, I would get a bill I could barely afford, and then he would explain that he clearly meant that he would pay for the first couple of rounds, and if I drink more than that, it was my fault. Several times, I had to borrow money from him to pay the rent, which further put me in his control. I would like to take a brief break and address the elephant in the room. I realized that every single one of my previous mentioned problems stemmed from me. I could have moderated my drinking. I could have told him no when he asked me to go out. I could have realized sooner that he was never truly going to pay for my bar tab or that we weren't going to be home early. I take responsibility for all these things. That being said, something you have to understand about Steve is that he would gaslight and make me feel like I was being a bad friend if I ever told him no despite having a very valid reason for the refusal. What I'm trying to do by telling you this part is to point out that he was never the good friend I thought he was, or he would have pointed out that I was drinking too much. Would it have stopped me? As I know from my numerous attempts by another really true friend, no, I wouldn't have. But at least in hindsight, I would be able to say, you know, Steve tried to get me to stop drinking. He was a good friend. Anyways, back to the story. Some few months after moving to the new city, Steve introduced me to a friend of his from out of town, Jennifer. She was a very pretty woman with dyed red hair, styled into a pixie cut. She was thin, athletic build, and a gorgeous face. She was honestly every straight man's dream. Not only that, but she was intelligent, funny, quick-witted, compassionate, and kind. I honestly developed a crush on her, but I was sure that she was out of my league. I asked Steve if she was seeing anyone though, because at this point, I still had some confidence. He told me that she wasn't and asked if I liked her. I said yes, and he assured me that he would try to get a feel of what she thought about me. Cut to a few days later, and Steve is now dating her. This confused the shit out of me. Because when he introduced us, they kept making jokes about how neither of them was really interested in the other, and that they would never work as a couple. I think even back then, I knew he had done his psychological fuckery to get her to date him so he could, once again, assert his dominance over me. I shrugged it off, happy that my friend finally found a girl to make him forget that freshman he had been dating a couple years ago. He had constantly moaned about missing her, when she finally got the courage to tell him to fuck off one night after he called her fat. She was maybe 95 pounds. Over the next few weeks, I started to notice that Jen was looking more and more exhausted and haggard. When I asked her if she was okay, she would just smile and assure me that her workout was just getting to her. We had started to become friends, so I asked her not to hesitate in coming to me if there was anything I could do to help her out. She thanked me for my kind gesture, 
but again, she said she would be fine. I would later find out that Steve was treating her the same way that he had treated his previous girlfriend. She apparently told Steve about my offer to help, thinking it was sweet that I wanted to help her. And as you might guess, Steve flew off the fucking handle. I had never seen him so angry. He came into my apartment, banging on the door, fit to break it down, and screaming at me to get my two-faced ass out in the hallway so he could kill me. I didn't know this at the time, but Steve had just started taking steroids, which explained part of his unfounded rage. After nearly an hour of him pacing my living room, threatening me, and yelling loud enough to wake the whole damn neighborhood, I was finally able to convince him that my intentions were nothing but friendly towards Jen. Bro code dictated that even if the two of them broke it off, I wasn't going to pursue her since she had dated one of my best friends. Once he finally believed that I wasn't going to stuff his girl like a Thanksgiving turkey, as he put it, it was like a switch was flipped. Suddenly we were best friends again and his earlier rage seemed to have been forgotten as if it never happened. He dumped Jen shortly after. My guess is he realized I had no romantic interest in her anymore and therefore couldn't use his relationship with her to needle me and control me. I only saw her a handful of times after that, but the last time I saw her, she looked so much happier. Yet another sign about Steve I either didn't see or chose to ignore. About a month after the yelling incident, Lisa and I got back together. She was incredibly distrustful and weary of me at this point, and rightly so. I had broken her heart for no other reason that I was an idiot. Over time, she began to trust me more with her emotions again. This was a mistake on her part, and I don't mean to sound cruel. Perhaps I had picked up some things from Steve. I know that I was fairly manipulative. I am more ashamed of that than I can even portray with words. I hate myself to this day for some of the ways I've treated her. During our second stint as a couple, Lisa was still uncomfortable around Steve and she would often leave if we were hanging out and Steve showed up. He never seemed to catch on that she didn't want to be around him. Things were made far worse when we went to a house party one night and Steve groped her. Again, I'm incredibly ashamed to admit what I did when she came to me in tears of rage and disgust and told me what happened. I'm ashamed because the first thing out of my mouth was, Steve wouldn't do that. Maybe you misunderstood what was going on. He smacked my ass and grabbed my chest. Alright, I'll go talk to him. I should have just cut him out right then and there. I should have taken Lisa home. I should have went and knocked Steve the fuck out. I should have done a lot of things, but I've always been a people pleaser. And Steve brought this out of me in the worst way. When I asked Steve about the situation, he told me that he had grabbed her waist to get around her in the kitchen, which was crowded, and that he accidentally brushed against her breast while reaching for the bottle of rum. I fucking believed him. I went back to Lisa and conveyed what he had told me. After a lot more enraged tears and yelling, she laughed. Why she didn't just dump my stupid, harassment apologist, victim blaming ass right then, I still don't know. When Steve appeared a few minutes later, I explained what happened. He put on a sympathetic face and said with a chuckle, Man, fuck that bitch. Let's find you a hot, drunk bitch who wants to give you a blowjob. Even back then, I knew that that was a huge red flag and I did not have sex with a drunk woman, but I still ignored the signs. Lisa didn't speak to me for a week and she was right to do so. She should have never spoken to me again. For the next few months, things with Steve were a bit strained, and we didn't hang out much. Things with Lisa improved again, now that Steve wasn't around as much. We were even talking about moving in together. This would not ever happen, because I was going to break up with her before long. I didn't know why I was going to do it at this time, but I know it was going to happen. When it did happen, there were no tears like last time. There was no pleading that we could make it work. Lisa simply fixed me with an emotionless, almost dead gaze and said, My sister told me not to trust you again. I should have listened. Get your shit and get out of my apartment. Now, I really wish she would have left it at that, but over the next couple of years, we would go on to have a few stints as friends with benefits. As we both knew what the other wanted in bed, and it was just easier for both of us, I think. 
being highly sexual beings to find comfort with each other when we wanted sex, I obviously obliged. There were no feelings in it for her. It was just sex. We never got back together, but we did become sort of facsimile of friends again for a while. Shortly after our breakup, I became immensely depressed. I didn't realize that it was because I was still in love with Lisa. Why would I be? I had broken things off with her. Regardless, I started drinking even more and stopped working out. I started regaining all the weight I had lost my freshman year of college and Steve noticed. After remarking that I was a fat fuck, I never really minded it because I was used to my weight being the butt of every other joke. Besides, he always said it with a laugh to let me know that he was only joking. The way good friends always insult each other, right? At the same time, I started hanging out with him again. One day, he came to me, asking if I wanted to move into a house with him. I politely declined because I liked living alone, and my rent was relatively cheap for where I lived. He called me a pussy and got unreasonably angry, saying that I owed him everything. He proceeded to scream at me for an hour and a half. He didn't speak to me for three days, but eventually calmed down. He never apologized for his ridiculous outburst though. When he moved out, another mutual friend took his apartment after having just gone through a breakup of his own, and I started hanging out with this new friend, Mark, quite a bit since he was just across the courtyard and Steve was a couple miles away. During this time, I met a man through Mark who would go on to become one of my two best friends that I've ever had and one of the most amazing people I've ever known. Enter Nick. Remember the friend I mentioned earlier who I said regularly tried to get me to stop drinking? That's Nick. He was and is the man who, for some reason, I never want to disappoint. Even today, being mostly sober, a huge part of what keeps me from drinking is the idea that if Nick found out, I'd be more ashamed of myself than if I publicly shit my pants in front of the woman of my dreams. Personally, that to me is the mark of a true friend, mostly because Nick never asked for or expected me to feel this way. In fact, I think he was a little uncomfortable with it, but it's not something that I could just turn off. Nick and I hit it off fairly quickly and started hanging out regularly. It was with Nick and a circle of friends, all of whom I proudly now call my own friends, that a Dungeons and Dragons group was started and lasted for nearly four years. Nick plays a bigger, if not huge, part in the story later. Things continue this way for maybe half a year before I finally decided to take Steve up on his offer and move into his house with him. Mostly because money was tight and my bills would go down. His current roommates had moved away for whatever reason and he had a couple vacancies. I took one room and a friend of his from when he was in boot camp, Greg, took the other. For a while, things were awesome. Steve had apparently become Catholic. He was off the Jews. It seemed like I had my old friend back from the days when we first had started becoming chummy. Steve, Greg, and I would often go on road trips or out to bars or just to some outdoor attractions around the city and walk around. Now remember when I said that Steve had been discharged from the military and claimed that it was due to an injury? Turns out that was not true at all. One night while Steve was at work, Greg and I were hanging out with some beers and the topic came up. You know he was crazy, yeah? Greg asked. What do you mean? He got kicked out before he finished boot camp. Really? He told me that he suffered some kind of injury and they had to let him go. After I said this, an incredulous look came over Greg's face and he turned slowly to look at me. He then proceeded to tell me what Steve had told me was an utter lie. He told me that Steve had had a reason to suspect that his then wife was cheating on him and had been overheard by a commanding officer saying that when he was going to finish boot camp he was going to murder them both and the daughter that he and his wife had. He had been given an in-depth psychological evaluation and been discharged, essentially for being too insane for the military. I later confirmed this with some of Steve's childhood friends. At this point, I was starting to realize who Steve really was, thinking back on some of the interactions I had with him. Unfortunately, I was stupid loyal to someone I perceived to be a good friend. At some point, I had invited Nick to come over and hang out, to play video games and whatnot. And when Steve met Nick, he immediately called him fat, 
Now, Nick was at the time a large man. He has since made some enormous strides in his fitness journey. Shout out to Nick for your hard work if you're reading this. You look great regardless. I remember the look of utter disbelief on Nick's face, but I defended Steve by saying that that's just how he made friends. If he wasn't calling you names, then it meant that he didn't like you. By the way, can we stop that shit? Treating people like shit as a way to break the ice is fucking terrible. I'm guilty of that in the past, and I hate that I used to do it. Anyway, not relevant. I could tell that Nick was skeptical, but he just kind of went with it. I think he kind of resented me for not defending him, but he never said so. I don't blame him if he did. A few weeks after the conversation with Greg, Steve had a friend of his from out of town stay with us for the weekend. Greg was out of town for work or something. I forget the details. Before this friend of Steve's arrived, he told me that she was fat, but pretty, and if I wanted to bone down with her, I had his blessing. This did not sit well with me, not only because of how he described her, which I learned wasn't true when she arrived, but because he felt the need to give his permission for two of his friends to have sex with each other. I kept my mouth shut though. I forget the woman's name, but she was a very pretty woman. She was curvaceous, but in no way fat. I was confused as why Steve would describe her as such. She and I got along really well from the start. That night, she and Steve slept together. Again, I'm fairly certain he slept with her because he could tell I was taking a liking to her. I wasn't falling over myself to get in a relationship with her, but I did like her quite a bit. Steve had once again asserted his dominance over me. The next day, we all had lunch at a local restaurant, and Steve had essentially left his friend and myself to drive his car back to the house while he wandered off to do God knows what. I was infuriated that he would do that, not necessarily the leave us part, but the fact that his friend had came to town specifically to visit him, and he had just built on her for no real reason. She and I spent the day watching movies and playing video games. We talked quite a bit about Steve, as he was our common link, and a lot of things came to light about Steve that I won't mention here, simply because I don't want to be typing this for the next two weeks. I texted Steve multiple times throughout the day, asking where he was. He didn't respond to me until about midnight, when I sent a text telling him it was kind of shitty of him to just leave his friend with me when she had came to see him. The text I got back just read, Mind your fucking business, fatty. I'll be home when I get home. He finally rolled up around 10 the next morning, and as his friend was getting ready to leave, he was driving a motorcycle that I had never seen before. He barely said goodbye to the woman as she was leaving, and when the door shut, I rounded on him. Where the fuck were you, dude? Feeling myself get angrier by the word at what he had done. Not that it's any of your fucking business, but I was helping a friend bury a body. He shot back as he walked into his room. I knew instantly that that was a lie. I had this intuition when it came to Steve, I could almost always tell when he was lying, and this one was just so outlandish that I didn't even need to consider it to know that it was absolute bullshit. No you fucking weren't, I said under my breath. What was that, Batty? He said, coming back into the room shirtless and getting into my face. I gently pushed him away from me, and he looked utterly dumbfounded. He couldn't believe that I would ever stand up to him like this. I said, you're lying, I retorted quickly, enunciating. But if you want to treat your friend like shit when they travel for four hours just to hang out with you for a couple days, then be my guest. We stood there glaring at each other for a few seconds before he deflated and looked slightly ashamed, which shocked the hell out of me. I was with a girl I'd been dating, he said softly. So you invited your friend to stay with us? I said, my anger rising again. Cheated on your girlfriend with her. Bailed on us. And then fucking lied to me about it? Fuck you. You're a fucking douchebag. I turned on my heel and stormed into my room. I'm fairly certain Steve threw something at me, but he missed. Because I heard a loud thump on the wall, just to the left of the doorway as I walked through. I didn't stop to find out. I didn't see or speak to Steve for a couple of days after that. 
It wasn't until Greg came home from his trip that I noticed that we weren't spending time together and were acting coldly towards one another that our friendship started to repair a bit. Most of it was due to Greg yelling at us that he wasn't going to live with a couple of bitches who couldn't get their shit together and act like adults. Despite our relationship repairing slightly, things were never really the same after that. Over the next few months, Steve started selling drugs and always kept a loaded gun in the house. I specifically remember him telling me one day that some guy was going to be coming over to give him some money that he was owed. And if he showed up when Steve was at work, I was supposed to take the money, count it, and put it on his bedroom desk. I didn't know he was dealing at the time, so I assumed that it was just a guy that owed him money. I agreed and went back to playing video games as he left for work. Steve got home from work before the guy showed up, and then there was a knock on the door. Steve came out of his bedroom with the gun in hand and held his finger to his lips. He opened the door to reveal a man standing on the porch with a wad of cash in hand. Steve immediately pointed the gun at his face, cocked the hammer back, and started screaming at him to drop the fucking money on the ground and get the fuck off his porch. As the dude was fleeing in terror, Steve yelled after him that if he ever saw him again, he would kill him. Of course, I was immediately distressed by what I had just witnessed but I was equally terrified when he turned to me with a huge grin after collecting the money from the porch and closing the door. I just gave him a weak smile and ignored the whole thing. I learned later that he was back on steroids when it happened. During this time, Steve would regularly come home late at night, three sheets to the wind ranting about one ethnic group or another. The one that sticks out in my mind the most was when he stumbled in so drunk that he could barely string together a coherent thought. He was yelling about globalism and how the Chinese were trying to take over the world. He mumbled a string of words that I couldn't make out then and shouted clear as day, Ping Ling, followed by another string of unintelligible bullshit and finally, fucking our daughters. As the last word left his lips, he immediately fell on the floor and began to sob. I had no idea what to do. If I tried to help him, I know that he would get violent towards me. In the end, I did nothing. I just went to my room. A few weeks after that particularly lovely incident, Steve and I got into an argument about something I can't remember. He stormed off into his room, and I thought it was over. I knew from experience that given time and distance, he would calm down. He would never apologize, but at least the situation would de-escalate. I was wrong this time. Ten minutes later, he comes crashing back into the living room, gun in hand, and pointed it in my face, yelling that if I wasn't going to respect him, that he might as well just kill me. You're not going to shoot me. I said far more calmly than I felt. Inside, I was shitting my pants, despite the fact that I did honestly believe he wasn't going to shoot me. I had been around guns before, but never had one pointed at me. Yeah? Why do you think that? I know you're not going to shoot me because I'm one of the few real friends you have left. He seemed to consider this for a moment and finally lowered his gun. His face was still murder incarnate, but at least the gun wasn't pointed at me. Can you move, man? I asked. I'm trying to watch Netflix. He continued to stare at me for a long while, seeming to be internally fighting with himself before finally stomping back into his room. I didn't see him again for the rest of the night. A few days later, Steve and Greg asked me to sit down when I had come home from my third double in a row at the restaurant where I worked. I asked why and they said we needed a talk about me living there. I told them that there was no need. I was moving out. They seemed satisfied with this and I went into my room to get some much needed sleep. A side note, as I was moving out, I accidentally broke the handle off of the storm door and Steve lost his mind, screaming at me, calling me all kinds of names, including the N-word. I assured him that I would replace it, but he just kept calling me names. Nick was helping me move out at the time, and once we were away from the house, he gave me a look that spoke volumes. I know, I said. I know. Part of the reason why I'm moving out. I didn't say anything, he replied. You didn't have to. This was the point that I finally snapped and realized that Steve was nothing but a toxic piece of shit. 
It took someone I hadn't known for very long, giving me a single fucking look for a puzzle piece to finally fall into place and make me go, fuck this bag of dicks. After I moved out, I only saw Steve once more. I was coming out of class on the university campus and he drove up on his motorcycle and started trying to make conversation. But I just made some sort of lame excuse about needing to get to work or home or something and walked away. After about a year, I blocked Steve completely on all social media when he commented on a Facebook post calling my mom the C-word. I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. About a year after that, Nick and I were at the mall. Being on a bit of a time crunch and needing things from different stores, we decided to head in different directions and meet up at the food court. I finished what I needed to do first and was standing in front of the Dairy Queen waiting for Nick to come meet me when I get a phone call from him. What's up? I just saw Steve. He was going into the store that I was coming out of. He didn't need to tell me which Steve. He knew most of the worst of what I've put in the story by this point. Although I'm sure some of these antidotes would surprise even him. My heart seemed to seize and I felt like I couldn't breathe. I hadn't spoken to Steve in over two years and the thought of coming face to face with him now filled me with dread. Hello? You there? Yeah, I said, finally finding my voice. I'll meet you at the car. That's why I told you. I'll be out in a bit. I practically sprinted to my car and just kept praying to whatever gods might exist that Nick would be out soon. I went over and over in my mind what I would say or do if Steve showed up. Luckily, I never had to find out what I would have done or said because Nick appeared pretty quick and we left. That was the last time I heard of Steve. The incidents that are portrayed in the story are not everything that happened, of course. In my relationship with Steve, there were more, including more death threats, a physical altercation, more name calling, and insurance fraud that Steve decided to rope me into without my knowledge. Now I know at this point you're wondering to yourself why I didn't just leave Steve in the dust a long time ago. Why didn't I just walk away from that friendship after the first sign of trouble? Well, there are a few reasons. First and foremost, as I said, Steve was a psychopath. Psychopaths are extremely versed in making people trust them, even if they treat them like trash. Not to mention that he gaslit me and made me feel as though a lot of the smaller incidents were my fault. That in turn led me in believing that the bigger problems were my fault. This is how psychological abusers keep control. Secondly, I'm a loyal friend to fault. I will see the best in people I care about even if they stab me in the back and beat me down. This is a fault of mine that I'm working on. I only saw the terrible in Steve when he treated another friend I was loyal to like shit. Third, a part of me was terrified to walk away. There was a piece of me that was scared, and sometimes still is, since I blocked him, that he would get it into his head to kill me because I rejected him. This again is part of the conditioning that abusers do. Regardless, I am much happier now and glad that I got the whole ordeal behind me. I would like to end this on a final note. If you are in a relationship of any kind where you are starting to see red flags, don't ignore them like I did. I explained away a lot of the red flags that Steve was waving proudly and I regret it to this day. I was lucky and got out of the most toxic friendship I've ever known with only some psychological trauma and having my confidence shattered. But it could have ended so much fucking worse. If you need help getting out, seek it immediately. Leave everything behind you if you have to. Things can be replaced. You can't. Anyway, thanks for reading this and Steve, please stay wherever you move to. I don't ever want to see or hear from you again. In 2016, my cousin Anna met a man named Jonathan. They were extremely happy together, to the point that in 2018, they got engaged. Anna, however, cheated on Jonathan shortly after with a man named Link. This was poorly solved by the idea to have a polyamorous relationship with Link. As time went on, Link turned into a horrific housemate and boyfriend. So Anna and Jonathan decided that it was time to remove him. 
This proved extremely difficult. Anna started by asking him to leave, and it didn't work. He refused to go. The landlord also refused to evict him due to him doing nothing wrong. They decided he needed a reason to leave, and I was tasked with removing him. I'm a complete pacifist, but I'm also six foot four and scared the fuck out of him. I told him to leave, and after I had a short conversation with the landlord, who he had just called, he was forced to leave via an eviction notice. After he was kicked out, he revealed that he was only there for Anna, who would have fucking guessed, and that he would revive the relationship. This was accomplished in a weird way. He was stalking her constantly, following her home from work, standing at her car when she went into the store, just being all around creepy. This was not only a bond to her though, he followed everyone else in the house. He would even keep tabs on me. I saw him watching me in the school parking lot and we decided things had to change. One night I visited them and told them about that event. Anna decided enough was enough. She called Link and told him to fuck off and that she would call the cops if she saw him again. We all went to sleep and thought that that would be the end of it. Oh boy, we were wrong. It was exactly 7 in the morning. I was woken up to what sounded like thunder over and over again. The entire house was shaking. He was at the front door punching it, trying to get in. Because he was so crazy, I had carried a gun to their house the night before, just in case of this. I yelled, I'm ready to fucking kill you if you're ready to fucking die. He took this notice seriously. The cops were angry about me threatening him, but due to the circumstances, they let me go. I was there a month later and was having a good time with them, playing video games, beating Jonathan's ass at Mortal Kombat, as I do. And then I saw him looking at me through the window. I freaked the fuck out. It was like a spider crawling up your arm. He bolted the moment I saw him and I couldn't sleep that night. A few nights ago, I came over again and I woke up in the middle of the night. I wanted a glass of chocolate milk and an ibuprofen as my head hurt and I needed to sleep. I went to the kitchen and he was there. He had a big fucking knife in his right hand. I remember freezing and looking at him. His pupils were dilated and he really freaked me the fuck out. He said, it's not what it looks like. I'm just here to stab Jonathan in his face. I love her so much and everything was fine before she intervened. I ended up attacking him and got the knife away from him before he ran. When the police finally caught him, he informed us that they would hold him for a bit and give him a warning. Because technically, since he was fighting in a court, it was still his house and the eviction had not fully gone through. They told us that we needed a restraining order to keep him away. You might ask, why am I writing this? Well, the only way I could sleep is to write about my experiences. However, he will slip up again and get arrested or something. But as long as he's around, I'm going to have trouble sleeping and I'm scared for everyone I care about's life. When I was 13, I had not long broken up with this girl who supposedly had a psycho family. One of this girl's family was a very close friend who was supposedly obsessed with her. I was invited out with my friends after school one day and this boy latched on. Everyone told me to come out and that he wanted to make amends and that he understood why I did what I did. Being the pushover I am, I went out and hung out in the parks and smoked and drank. As it started to get dark, I decided to go home. I felt uneasy being around him and he started acting all weird talking about fights he had been in. He was bragging about bashing some guy's face in with his fist in school. Because of this, I left. I didn't feel safe whatsoever. The next day, my best friend and all the other kids that were out that night came to school and told me it got worse after I left. Apparently, after they had drank some more, he started waving this huge kitchen knife around and telling everyone that he was going to stab me in the stomach for breaking that girl's heart. My dad made us move since he knew where I lived. I continued getting death threats on social media though. Until about a year or two later, when it was in the paper and it was spread all around town. 
He had broken into someone's house and stabbed a man to death and then slit his wrist in the man's bathtub. They found high amounts of cocaine and cannabis in the system, along with a lot of alcohol. The elderly neighbor phoned the police when they heard some commotion and when they hadn't seen the man leave for work. They found the attacker barely conscious and he's now in a psych ward. Again, this was supposedly over a girl. I think I dodged a bullet there. My father had been dating this girl for a while and things were going great. She met us a few times and got along together with my sister and I. Eventually, my father asked her to move in with us. She drove seven hours to move in and brought her two cats. Things were great for the first two months until she couldn't find a job. They had agreed that she was to apply for jobs and have one secured for interview before she moved in. She moved in July 2nd, and she didn't have a job until late January. I, being fresh out of high school with no job experience, was able to get a job before her. This caused my father to have to cover her car payments and insurance, and it set us back financially, but we were okay. Then October came with the discovery of a full year's worth of text messages between her and a friend of hers named Jared, all taking place after my father and her were dating and while she was still living in her hometown. The text messages were laced with him coming over to give her nighttime lovin's and inappropriate pictures. My father confronted her about it and she denied it, saying we just didn't understand her friendship. My father lets it go, and they haven't messaged each other in weeks. Small arguments pop up and she starts sneaking money out of my dad's wallet at night to go buy cigarettes. This may only sound like small stuff, but it was a nightly occurrence. This set us back financially as well. The arguments mainly consisted of her lying about something and not admitting to it, or doing something stupid and not apologizing. Things got worse when Christmas came. My father expressed that he didn't love her anymore, he didn't have feelings towards her, and that she needed to work to fix the relationship if she wanted it to continue. This meant really trying to get a job and not lying about stupid shit. She agreed that she would. I advised him against giving her that option. I was tired of her shit and wanted her out. She started lying more and more and causing more problems. We believe she started taking some sort of drugs as she would come back from a drive all shaky and spazzing out, spouting nonsense. She came after myself and a friend of mine during one of their arguments, to which my father responded, Pack your shit and get the fuck out. How dare you go after my kids, you bitch. Telling her to get out and leave was a regular occurrence in their fights, but she never took the hint. She was abusive emotionally to everyone in the household, especially my father, reducing my father to tears when he found out that she had been receiving $1,000 a month from her mother which would have had us staying up to date on our rent payments. We have no idea what she did with the money. No matter the situation, she would always try to twist it so that she would be the victim. Nothing is ever her fault, and it's always a misunderstanding. Then she started smoking in the garage. The door from the garage into the house is right across from my bedroom door, which is always open because our cats like sleeping on my bed with me. I have asthma. I woke up coughing and smelling cigarettes multiple times in one night because of her. She drove recklessly with my little sister and I in the car before, and I told my dad what happened. When he confronted her, she said I was over-exaggerating, that driving in the dark freaks her out, that my sister and I were stressing her out. A minor thing, but she endangered my sister and my cats. We have two strictly indoor cats, and her two were outdoor cats until they moved here. Her cats taught my cats how to sneak out of the house when the front door is unlatched. She leaves the front door open constantly when she comes back from smoking and lets the cats out. We live right across the street from a huge lot of desert and we have coyotes here every night. After she finally got a job, she didn't want to contribute to her fair share of the bills. My father asked her for half her paychecks every two weeks. She claimed it should only be 25% because there were four people in the house. 
My sister and I were only there on the weekends as we go to school outside of town, about an hour away, and stay with other family during that time. She apparently wasn't paying her car payments after she got this job as she got a repossession notice which she hid from my father. Finally, after financially wrecking us, abusing my father emotionally and financially, endangering myself and my sister, doing drugs, taking money, stealing things from my room, endangering my cats, and many other things, my dad finally gave her two weeks to move out. She moved out yesterday, and all I have to say to her is, let's not meet again, because I will not be nice to you like I had to be before. Lots of hate, the daughter of the man you broke. I would like to make something abundantly clear in the beginning of this. I was very naive in my youth. Very naive. While my ex was emotionally, sexually, and mentally abusive, he was smart enough to never lay a hand on me physically. He used gaslighting, manipulation, and carefully hidden sadism to control me for 8 years. I forgave him for every slight against me, every instance of cruelty, every mental assault, and every sexual attack. I forgave him because I thought he loved me and that I was his property because we had been together for so long and I wore his promise ring. In my mind, I was dealing with actions that would eventually go away with age. I was 17 when I finally got the courage to leave him, and since then, he has left messages on Facebook, my phone, my email, called me from texting apps. It was always the same message he leaves. I'm still here. Every month like clockwork. Same time, same day, same message. He has done this for six years, and I could do nothing about it. He wasn't breaking any laws, so I couldn't really report him, and nobody cared about it anyway. I blocked each account and continued on with my life, but two months ago, the messages stopped completely, and I know why. I got engaged to another man on the same day he messaged me for the last time, and posted about it on Facebook, and magically, the messages stopped. He stopped because I was going to marry someone else, and in his mind, I am no longer his property. This is the only thing that makes sense to me, that he believes I belong with a new man and not him, but I have a feeling I have not seen the last of him. So to my ex-boyfriend of 8 years, let's not meet again. Reading through some of the stories here reminded me of a fun one I heard with one of my ex-girlfriends. I don't really remember exactly how it came up, but I think it had something to do with her grabbing some stuff from under the bed one night. Basically, she wouldn't do it and was terrified of it. I never understood why until she told me. Her cousin, who she adored, came home one night to find the house unlocked. They were really confused and frightened about why, so they checked the house, but couldn't find anything missing. They just assumed they had left the place unlocked. The next night, my ex's cousin was laying on her bed, doing whatever young girls do, when her cat would just not shut up. It was laying on the floor of her room, hissing. Despite her appeals, the cat kept going, being very aggressive towards the underside of the bed she was lying on. She decided to see what the fuss was about. She got down on her hands and knees and looked. There was a guy laying there, on his side, staring right into her eyes, holding up a mean-looking knife. The girl obviously screamed like crazy and bolted out of her room, taking her cat with her. Her parents came running. She hysterically told them that there was a man under her fucking bed with a knife. Her dad grabbed her door and threw it shut, locking the guy in there while the police were called. As much as he tried to hold this guy inside the room, the guy ended up overpowering him and getting the door open and running as fast as he could out of the house. Thankfully, no one was hurt but the guy was never found. Thankfully, my bed is very low and couldn't fit anyone under it. 